just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let's sing together, Heart of Worship. When the music plays, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Only just to bring something to work that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song is.
you are able, um, if you would stand with us again. And if you become uncomfortable or need to remain seated, that's fine too. Um, just in honor of God's word, I may ask you to stand a little more uh, this, or this morning. Beginning back in Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 6. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart I worship you. All I have within me, I give you. Continuing in Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ.
that me? <laughs> okay. Good morning. 
I'm excited for today because uh, today is an unusual day. Uh, not always do we get to break the, the form of routine, uh, but today we do. And uh, in a very good way, we get to have a tailgating thing, which as Wisconsinites, we understand that. Uh, and we get to have a baptism all in one, so this is fantastic. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, that being the case, there won't be a PM service. Uh, there, it will just be the tailgating thing. So if you show up here tonight at 6, uh, you'll be alone or with whoever else shows up here tonight at 6 on accident. Um, but uh, just to put that on your radar, we're really looking forward uh, to this day. And uh, it already looks brighter outside. And uh, praise God for that. So uh, I, I figured today I would start with an apology which maybe that's not the right way to start a sermon. I don't know. I'm kind of new at this. Um, but I'd start with an apology because uh, Sean and I set you up. Uh, and I have to thank Sean because he did a great job uh, with those songs. Uh, but the nature of the songs, the message of the songs, was kind of what I wanted to talk about a little bit this morning as we refer to the idols of our stuff. Um, I was thinking... Uh, in my office as, as I was putting this together, just trying to figure out, you know, what it is that God wanted uh, from this, and he kind of laid this topic on my heart. Um, I was thinking about how many songs we sing, uh, Christian songs, we sing them all the time, that have this theme to it, uh, the theme of giving our all to God, giving our heart to God. It's everything for you, God. And, and as you think about it, uh, there's actually quite a few uh, songs like that. Um, yeah, there's, I just have them scrolling behind me. Uh, you are my all in all. Heart of worship, we sang that this morning. I give you my heart. Um, I surrender all, a little bit older one. Uh, lay me down, a little bit newer one. Uh, every move I make, <laughs> this song. We, uh, we sing it in youth group right now, but we were singing it when I was in youth group, and that was like a long time ago. I, it, and it has the same theme to it. And what I notice is that throughout the age of the church, uh, we are compelled to sing about this theme, about giving our everything to God. And I think it's appropriate. I think it's very good. But I think if, that there's no harder thing for us to sing about than about giving our everything to God. And that's because we are so often split amongst ourselves between what we want and serving ourselves and serving God wholeheartedly. It's like a constant battle that we go through. And so whenever I come up on songs like this, I love them, but I choke. Sometimes I can't even sing because, like do I really mean it? And so the challenge here this morning, the challenge of the message, uh, the challenge of the songs is to evaluate our lives for idols that might be there and ask ourselves, are the lyrics that we sing in a song consistent with the lyrics uh, that our lives may have on display? So today, like I, you see up on the screen, I'm talking about casting down idols. Um, but to start with that, I think it's fair to start with, uh, with a definition. When I say idol, what is it that I mean? Um, now, the first thing that comes to my mind is a little statue. And I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and guess that most of you don't have a little statue at home that you burn incense to or sacrifice goats for or something like that. Um, you probably don't wander down to the Fireman's Memorial and find a statue there and serve it or something like that. Um, I'm going to guess that in our culture here in America, that definition of idol is a little bit more irrelevant. That is something that you do, talk to me after the service, that's wholly separate from what I'm talking about here today. Um, but but I, think, uh, I think that to define idol in, in more of an inclusive manner, in really the way that we have them as Americans, uh, would be something like this. Scripturally speaking, an idol is anything that takes the worship that we should otherwise be giving to God. That is what an idol is. That's also what an idol does. An idol steals God's worship. But I'll go one further than that. An idol doesn't just steal God's worship. Sometimes an idol is content to try to share God's worship. See, we don't always go up to an idol in life and have something take hold in our life as an idol and just give it everything all in one fell swoop. Sometimes we just give it part of um, and we take something away from God and we give it to that thing as we make an idol of it. The funny thing about idols is that they're never content to just share God's worship. And God's never content to share his worship with anyone or anything. But eventually that idol will want more and want all. It wants to steal. So let's define worship really quick. Just to get kind of all on the same page here this morning. Worship is an act of devotion and dedication 
to a thing. It ascribes worth and preeminence to whatever the thing is that is worshipped. So that's what worship is. So if we talk about idolatry, idolatry is, uh, is giving devotion and preeminence to something other than God. That's idolatry. That's idolatry as the Bible sees it. Yes, that can be a little statue, but it can also be a, uh, a job, a car, a relationship. I see it, it, the, the spectrum is very broad when it comes to how this can apply. In Scripture, in Scripture there is a, uh, a tension that I feel all the way through the pages of it. It's, it's, it's like a, a rubber band pulled back. It's, it's like a, a spring coiled up. It's just like something that, that is there that wants to be paid attention to. It's behind the surface all the time. It runs throughout the pages of Scripture, just dripping with this. And it's a question. And the question is whether or not we will trust God. It's kind of interesting. That question has been there, I mean, ever since Adam, and it exists up until today. And that's because the measure of our trust determines the nature of our worship. The measure of our trust determines the nature of our worship. Worship requires trust. I would argue, I, 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 would, I would love to see someone make a case for how you worship without trusting the thing that you're worshiping. It doesn't make any sense to me. Worship requires trust. And as I think through the pages of Scripture and this tension that is there, this question that is there, will you trust God? I think about Adam. Adam, if, if anyone had a chance to get, like, worship perfect, he is totally set up by God in the garden to get this worship just right. Everything was made good. It was very good. There's no sin, nothing in the way. And God tells him one thing. He says, you can eat of all the trees, just don't eat of that tree. And at the, at the base of that command is is this idea, trust me with what I tell you. And Adam, what does he do? Well, obviously we know, we <laughs> have the result of that. Uh, he disobeys God, thinking that God is keeping something from him. There's, there's, there's a trust issue that ruined his worship for the rest of his life and got in the way of so many other people's worship. You think about Israel, uh, Israel quite often had a habit of falling into idolatry. We read about this in the Judges and many other places in Scripture. Um, Israel fell into idolatry, and every single time they fall into idolatry, you kind of watch the same pattern happen over and over and over again, and the question comes back, will you trust God? And whenever they fall into idolatry, they're not trusting God, they're trusting themselves. They're trusting foreign gods. They're trusting in foreign nations to provide security or something for them other than trusting in God. They're disobeying God. And at the root of that, it get, gets back to this question of whether or not they'll trust God. And my question for you this morning here is have you ever had a time in your life where you did not trust God and yet had meaningful and consistent worship? I doubt that you have. The point here is that when we have idols in our lives, we are inevitably trusting those idols to fulfill or provide something for us. That's what happens when we have idols in our lives. We trust them for something. And I think you can kind of break it down into, uh, I guess you'd say sort of a formula. I'm not much of a formula guy, but um, I think so often sin, it looks complicated when we're in the midst of it. It just blinds our eyes. We lie to each other. We lie to ourselves, and we don't see the truth. But at the root of it, it gets kind of simple. And you can almost plug idolatry into this formula, and it kind of looks like this. Because I have blank, whatever the thing may be, whatever the idol may be, because I have blank, I will have status, security, happiness, health, knowledge, pleasure, worth, purpose, ease, power, whatever the thing is that you're after, that you trust that idol to give to you, to provide for you. And this is how idolatry works. We find a thing and we trust in it to provide something that really we should be looking to God to provide. That's how idolatry works in our lives. Um, so let's just plug a couple things into it and take a look at this. Let's say, because I have a certain job. Now, jobs are good. There's nothing wrong with a job. I hope everyone has a job. <laughs> um, but if the job becomes an idol, that's a bad thing, right? Everyone went like this. Some of you went like... <sighs> um, but anyways, because I have a job, because I get this promotion, I will have... Well, I mean, I can look to that and say, well... I'll have security because I have this job. 
is because I have this job, I know I'll be financially better set. Maybe if I get this promotion, I'm going to be able to handle life financially. Um, I'm just going to feel better about what I can do. Maybe I can afford a little bit extra, and I can buy that boat, that ATV, that toy, whatever it is. We're in Wisconsin Rapids. We understand that. Uh, I can get that thing. That'll give me happiness. And if I'm happier, I'm healthier. And, and you can just go down the line of the things that you can look to for this job. And so what do we do? How do we turn it into an idol? And what we do is we start looking at, let's say, a job in this situation, this job, this promotion. I'm going to put everything in my life into pursuing this. This will have preeminence in my life. Other things will be sacrificed on the altar of this job. And we trip into idolatry. We sacrifice for this job. We give preeminence to this job because we trust this job to provide these things. And it takes a place in our life that doesn't belong. Let's put a different thing in there. Because I have this relationship, because I have this boyfriend, because I have this girlfriend, because, uh, let's just say, I, I hang around with this certain group of friends. That says something about me, you know, um, because this group has status, popularity, whatever. Because I have this relationship, sometimes we look at that and we say, well, I will have worth. Isn't that so often what we look for out of relationships? We look for some sort of self-affirmation, someone else to say, I'm worth something. But that isn't where we should get our worth. Not at all. But we tend to do that, don't we? We want someone to confirm that we're worth something. Somehow, as if one another, we can tell each other something that means more than what God says about us. And we think we'll find worth, we'll think we'll find purpose, boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe we'll think we're going to find pleasure. And maybe in the short term, we do. But what we do is, is we chase those things. We, let's say we chase that relationship and we give it preeminence and we give our time to it and we sacrifice what our relationship is with God for it and we make compromises and idolatry. And that's where we find ourselves. And that's how this works. Like I said, it's actually very simple the way that this works because our hearts, fickle as they are, are kind of simple uh, at times. We just bury it under layers of complicated lies. When we look to these idols, when we look to idols for these things, we inevitably make two mistakes at one time. And this is kind of crazy because sin does this. Sin will sell you a lie and it turns out to be two lies, three lies, like a whole bundle of lies. And this is what you buy when you buy into this concept of idolatry uh, and, and start trusting in these things to provide for you. The first lie is this. We leave God for what is powerless. We leave God for what's powerless. Sure, you can have a relationship and someone that will make you feel good and say that you have worth, but what their opinion is of you will not last or be anything near what the worth is of God Almighty telling you what your worth is because of what he has made you to be. I, it's just not the same. It's, it's powerless. It's weak. It will fail. And all these things will fail. They're corruptible. They're good for a little while, and they're good for this life, and that's it. We leave God for what's powerless. The second thing that we do, the second lie that we buy into, is that we assume God's role in determining that we must have status, health, wealth, power, pleasure, whatever it is that the thing is. We assume God's role in determining that we need these things, but God is the one who determines what we need in this life. And here's, here's a mind-blowing question. What, is, what if God has not meant for us to have some of those things? We assume, oh, these things are good, God is good, therefore God must give me these things. Eh, that's not how it works. I think about all the martyrs for Jesus. Did they have ease? Was that in the package for them? No, it wasn't. And, and to chase ease like we deserve it or God owes it to us or we expect it of God is wrong, we don't get to determine that. God determines what it is that he'll give us. And so often we are so focused on the thing that we want, you know, pleasure, worth, ease, whatever it is, and, and we'll, we'll do our own thing, we'll chase our own thing, we'll, we'll find an idol that, that fulfills that for us because we're determined that we have to have it and that might not be the case. God may have a different thing for you. Luke 18. Let's, let's look at Luke 18 really quick. So 
So Luke chapter 18, verse 18. Luke 18, 18. And the ruler asked him, him being Jesus, the ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack, sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. It's an invitation from Jesus. He says, come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, Then who can be saved? But he said, With men, it's impossible. Or, I'm sorry. But he said, What is impossible with men? Is possible with God. So there you have it, the story of the rich young man. And, and there's one thing that I want to pull from this. There's, there's probably a lot of things that can be pulled from this, uh, but one thing that I want to apply particularly today, and that is this. The man was sad. The man was sad because he wanted Jesus among the idols of his wealth, not to the exclusion of the idols of his wealth. That was the problem. And what Jesus was doing is the young man had gone through all these commandments that he's kept from his youth, and Jesus goes straight to the heart. He says, okay, I want you to love me and follow me to the exclusion of everything. I don't want your heart separated, divided. I don't want you to have idols in your life as you follow me. And when he calls him on that thing that was the idol in his life, the young man backed away. And it looks hopeless. It looks hopeless for the rich young man. And it looks hopeless uh, for, for many of us because how often do we do that when, when we think we have given God everything but really we just gave him the easy stuff. And when he picks on the one thing that's really the idol in our life, we start to back away. We say, I'm not sure I can follow you there, Jesus. But the grace of God to say that on our own, let's just admit we can't do this. We can't follow him. But with God, all things are possible. I think it's, it's easier to just add Jesus to our idols rather than remove our idols and have Jesus alone. And, and we're sneaky about this. In fact, so sneaky that it is we buy our own lie. Some, I think for a lot of things in life where, where we have a sin that we want to cover up and, uh, and we make a lie about it, we, uh, we lie in such a way that we know we're telling the lie. But I think when it comes to idolatry and the idols in our heart, we lie so well that even we buy the lie because we still show up to church and we still read the Bible sometimes and we pray when the life gets hard and we still recognize God is still in my life, but what we don't understand is that we have set God among other idols in our lives rather than being exclusive and giving ourselves to God alone. And we miss it, and I've missed it, and that's why I want to draw our attention to it this morning. Because that was the problem of the rich young ruler. And I think that can be our problem here today. In Judges, chapter 1, if you guys want to turn there, I think this is very interesting. This is kind of what got me started on this. And actually, this whole message is a great big God sighting. Because I did not know we were... Uh, gospel treason was going to touch on this exact topic. Um, and I just felt like, reading, after reading in the Judges, just personally, um, this was something I needed to talk about. And uh, so it's kind of cool how God is teeing the whole church up to have a conversation on this. Um, that's very good. In Judges chapter 1, chapter 1, you'll kind of see how I got going on this because this is disturbing. Chapter 1, verse 27, Manasseh, did not drive out the inhabitants, verse 29. Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites, verse 30. Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants, 
31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants. 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants. 34, the Amorites pressed the people of Dan back into the hill country, for they did not allow them to come down into the plain. And that's a problem. It's a problem because God told them that they were to completely drive out the inhabitants. And what they did instead was they went some of the way until they felt comfortable and they could live. And they called it good because it was easier to have God next to these people than to drive them out all of the way. It's easier to set God next to the idols in our lives than to remove them all the way and still claim allegiance to God. But there's a problem with that. And the problem comes... In verse 10, it says, In that generation also were gathered to their fathers, they died. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and to serve the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt. And they went after the other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them. And they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. This is the problem. This is the problem, like I said earlier. An idol that we allow to be part of our life, just to share our worship, will eventually want all of our worship. And the consequence of that doesn't always fall directly on us. Sometimes it falls on those who come after us. We make half a mistake and they make the whole mistake. And this is what happened in the judges, and this is what led to all the corruption, is because there wasn't full obedience. And it kills me, because they were that close. That close. So the question, the question I want to get to is, how do we know when we've made an idol in our life? Maybe you're sitting there, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you, and you're like, I know how I've made an idol in my life. And good, deal with that. That's what you need to deal with. But in case you're still wondering, let me throw a couple questions out to you. Um, based on this, simply put, recognizing idols means understanding worship. And knowing what we worship requires seeing what we trust. Remember, worship requires trust. What do you trust? If you go down to what you trust in life, you're probably going to figure out whether or not you have an idol there, whether or not you have a problem with it. So let's take a couple examples. When you have a difficult decision to make, do you immediately turn to God in prayer? Uh, do you look to God for wisdom? Is God the first thing on your mind? Is that where you go? Or do you turn inward to yourself for a solution, to friends and other people uh, for a solution, maybe to your money just to try to bail you out of a problem? I don't know. What about this? When you are... Um, when you're confused and beaten down by the hardship in life, there's no lie, hardship will come in life. Um, and as it comes to us, do we comfort our soul with truth from God's word? Or do we run from a situation to try to protect ourselves from it? Because sometimes there's hardship that God brings into our life and he just wants it to be there for a while. It's crazy. Uh, because there's, these are hardships that we would not choose to have in our lives. But God, being just sovereign and almighty and, and, and knowing all, he picks these things for us. And he grows us and he shapes us through them. And sometimes in the fire of that shaping, we jump out. We say, I think I'm good enough. It's like the chisel skit. We get chiseled a little bit and we call it good. We try to deliver ourselves from it instead of sticking through uh, and waiting for God to deliver us. Um, think about the way that you prioritize your time. I'm a big offender on this. Um, does Jesus have the preeminence in the way that you organize your time? Or is your walk with God something that you just don't have time for? And usually I find in my life that I have time for the things that I really want to have time for. Like life is not that bad. Life has bad moments that I just completely lose it. But I do not live in a place where I just cannot manage my time. Usually if I run out of time, it's because I've chosen to spend it on something else. Something else has gotten a priority. And more often than not, the things, the things that take Jesus' time in my life, that takes preeminence from Jesus in my life, is Netflix. <laughs> it's, it's vacation time. 
It's just foolish, silly things. It's time with friends, it's social media, it's extra sleep, it is, um, it's just laziness sometimes. So that literally sometimes I know I've just sat there and I've known I have time, I can be in the word, I can be praying, I, can, I should be doing this, and I just don't. Um, it, it is pathetic. And, and then I look around and I think, I'll do that later. It later comes and I'm too busy to do it later. And so I say, well, I'm just too busy. God didn't have time this week. No, I, I didn't give him time. And that's kind of how it is. That's how it has been in my life. And when we have Jesus among the idols in our life, and we do that for a long time, I think we, we reduce him from what he should be in our life down to one simple thing. And we just expect Jesus to provide salvation. We'll just keep it simple. Jesus, you stay over there. I'll claim allegiance to you. I'll, I'll need you for salvation. And then I'm going to go and scatter my affections on these other things. And that's kind of how it works. We don't like to say it like that, but that's how it works. And when Jesus doesn't have preeminence to, to the exclusion of all other idols in our life, we seek to identify with him while finding our satisfaction outside of him. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work in this relationship with God. It wouldn't work in your marriage. <laughs> it wouldn't work in a boyfriend-girlfriend situation to say, I, I claim, I, I identify with you, I claim allegiance, here's my ring, um, but I'm going to go scatter my affections amongst other men or women or something like that. It doesn't work like that. And it doesn't work like that with God. I mean, that's adultery. And funny thing is, that's what God calls it when we do not give ourselves wholly to him. He calls it spiritual adultery because that's, that's what it is. Um, that's what he calls it when we seek our peace and security from a job instead of Jesus. When, when we look for purpose in a relationship with a, purpo- with, with a person instead of him. Um, that's what he calls it when our time and affections are poured into our stuff and our possessions. And they get preeminence in our life. Last thing I'll say, I, uh, I really love the grace of God. I think it's huge um, because we don't often identify the idols in our lives. Like I said, we're very good at lying to ourselves uh, and we don't always live in a place of perspective and once in a while we will have these idols and God will show them to us. And maybe today is a place where you sit and God has shown something to you. My, my urging for you is don't look away. It's probably ugly. You see something in your life that doesn't belong there. You know that's an idol in my life. And maybe it's been there for a long time and it has preeminence over God and you think, oh, the work that would be required to get rid of this. Maybe I can just ignore it and think it's not that bad. I mean, I still love Jesus and he has most of me, just not all of me. It doesn't work like that. My urging to you is that if you see that, don't look away because it's ugly. Deal with it because we don't live here in a place of perspective. So I mean, more than likely, if you're anything like me, if you don't deal with it, you'll walk away and not an hour later will you completely forget and then just have like two more weeks of badness before you see what has gone on again. Because idols are sneaky and we lie to ourselves. We don't even know our own lies. So my challenge for you today is to think about what that idol may be. If so, deal with it. Let's pray. Father God, you ask a lot of us to give all of ourselves. So very few times I, I, I give all of myself to you, God. And I'm just, I'm spiritually ADD, I'm all over the place. And, and I fear that we all are like that. And God, let, let us start just by thanking you for your mercy uh, to still love us and call us back again and again. And, and if you have found us in a place where we should not be this morning, please help us to deal and, and do business with you here, God. Because life doesn't work any other way with any other thing being preeminent in our affections, God. Help us to be humble before you and turn our affections towards you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You are dismissed. Uh, I will see you at the lake very soon.